Chapter 3 The Battle Why the vile flesh? Since life by the faith of Christ is the only way God can work through us, you may wonder why God does not eradicate the sin nature, as my childhood church taught, and give us glorified flesh right now. The reason that God does not change our vile flesh is given to us in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7, but we have this treasure, earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, and not of us. If God gave us glorified flesh, because all unbelievers look on the outward appearance, 1 Samuel 16 verse 7, they would worship us. We would then get the glory, when God's plan is to bring glory to His Son, suffering. Why doesn't God at least eradicate the sin nature, so that we live perfectly? Because God has started a good work in us and will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, Philippians 1 verse 6. This work results in us being holy and without blemish, Ephesians 5 verse 27. God is the only wise God, 1 Timothy 1 verse 17. The Lord has used wisdom since the beginning of His way, Proverbs 8 verse 22. Wisdom says that the way to make us holy and without blemish is for us to suffer, I.L. Timothy 3.12. Remember that God is working on us spiritually, not physically, and we must suffer if He is to refine us. We see this with Israel. God says that He will bring Israel through the refiner's fire of the tribulation period. Only then will they be an offering pleasant unto the Lord, Malachi 3 verses 2-4. We see this with Paul. Paul was caught up to the third heaven and heard unspeakable words, 2 Corinthians 12 verses 2 and 4. By receiving an abundance of revelations, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7, there was a danger that his flesh would rear its ugly head, remember that the flesh lusteth against the spirit, Galatians 5 verse 17, dot. Therefore, there was given to, Paul, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet, him, lest, he, should be exalted above measure, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7. In other words, God has the wisdom to know that suffering is the only way a person can mature spiritually so that he can be more effective in the spirit realm for all eternity. You may say, if God would have eradicated Paul's sin nature, he would not have had that problem. Yes, the flesh would not have lusted against the spirit, but, without that adversity, he could not grow. For example, a six-foot basketball player would probably win every game he plays if he only plays people under five feet tall. However, he will be a much better basketball player if he only plays basketball players who are seven feet tall, even though he will lose most of the time. Look at Jesus Christ. He did not have a sin nature and never sinned. Yet, he was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, Matthew 4 verse 1. Why make it so hard on Jesus Christ? Because he could only learn obedience and be made perfect through suffering. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Hebrews 5 verse 8. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation, Jesus Christ, perfect through sufferings. Hebrews 2 verse 10. So, here is Jesus Christ, the sinless one, with no sin nature, and he still had to suffer in order to be perfect, complete. This shows that, even if God eradicated our sin nature when we were saved, we would still need to suffer in the flesh, because we are not perfected without adversity. That also ties into us not receiving glorified flesh, because it would be harder to suffer if we looked like gods to everyone else. That is why, when Jesus Christ came, he hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him, Isaiah 53 verse 2. If he looked like a god, they would not have crucified him, he would not have suffered, and he would not have been made perfect through sufferings. Therefore, God made him look like an ordinary human being. This means we should not be upset if God did not bless us with good looks, because only the Son of God had a choice as to what his flesh would look like, and he chose to look ordinary. Similarly, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, and not of us, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7. The passage then says, we are troubled on every side. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 8. In other words, because we still have our vile flesh after we are saved, Philippians 3 verse 21, we suffer. 
because suffering is necessary for the Lord Jesus Christ to finish his work in us, Paul concludes this suffering passage with the statement, Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 17. Praise the Lord for the privilege of suffering, free will. Another reason that God does not eradicate us in nature when we are saved is the same reason he gave us free will. God wants us to choose to allow Christ to live through us. God's angels never sin, and they do bring glory to God. However, God's plan in creating humans was to bring glory to his Son. He would create humans, we would sin, Christ would die for us to save us, God would place believers into Christ, and we would rule the universe for all eternity. We will go over the details of this later on. Because we rule the universe in Christ, Christ gets the glory. This is the glory plan that God fathered in the beginning, Ephesians 1 verse 17. If God never gave us free will, Christ would not be glorified because there would be no one to save. Moreover, contrary to popular churchianity's belief, God's plan does not stop at salvation. God has created stories in the heaven, Amos 9 verse 6. These stories are the governmental structure of thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, mights, and every name that is named, Ephesians 1 verses 20 to 21, Colossians 1 verse 16. God's plan is to use the body of Christ to fill these positions, Ephesians 1 verses 22 to 23, because, currently, the heavens are not clean in his sight, Job 15 verse 15. That is because Satan and one-third of the angels rebelled against God, Revelation 12 verses 3 to 4. If you were going to fill a high position in the United States government, in order to do a good job, you would need both education and experience. In fact, it is rare to find any job posting requiring a college degree that does not also require at least some experience doing a similar job. Why? Because, in the real world, you need real experience dealing with real problems so that you will be competent in the job as you deal with life's real problems. Similarly speaking, in God's governmental structure, we will be judging angels, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 3. If God placed us into Christ and eradicated our sin nature once we were saved, he would be forcing us to allow Christ to live in us. We would then not gain the real-world experience needed to judge effectively angels in eternity. Therefore, God must keep our sin nature around so that we can make a choice to allow the Holy Ghost to teach us the sound doctrine for today so that we grow in the experience necessary to fill a high position in heavenly place. Alternatively, we can choose to live in our flesh and not be fit for a high position in heavenly places. As members of the body of Christ, we have a unique opportunity that is only possible after the cross. That is, we can choose to believe God and His Word and allow Christ to live in us. Without Christ's faith, there is no choice. Conclusion Although Christ triumphed over Satan's forces in the cross, Colossians 2 verses 14 to 15, Satan and his forces will remain in their positions in heavenly places until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, Romans 11 verse 25. Then, the body of Christ will be gathered together unto the Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1, the event commonly called the rapture. Then, halfway through the tribulation period, Satan and his forces will be permanently kicked out of their positions in heaven, Revelation 12 verses 7 to 9. Therefore, if Satan can stop the body of Christ from being equipped to take those positions, the rapture will not come and Satan will continue to have power in the heavens. God's will is for all men to be saved, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. If people are saved, they are immediately placed into Christ and seated with Him in heavenly places, Ephesians 2 verses 5 to 6. To stop this from happening, Satan hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. If people are saved anyway, they are placed into Christ's death and resurrection, Romans 6 verses 3 to 4. This means that they are now alive in Christ, Romans 6 verse 11, and they receive forgiveness of sins, Ephesians 1 verse 7, eternal security, Ephesians 1 verses 13 to 14, the Holy Ghost, Romans 5 verse 5, to teach them the things of God, 
1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 13, and the faith of Christ, Galatians 2 verse 16 and 20, as the power to come unto the knowledge of the truth so that they may take a high position in heavenly places. When this occurs, Satan and his forces are one step closer to being kicked out of their positions. Therefore, in the last days of the dispensation of grace, perilous times shall come, 2 Timothy 3 verse 1, and evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, 2 Timothy 3 verse 13, because Satan knows that his time is short. However, God's plan will be fulfilled because God has inspired his word and preserved it, and his word truly furnishes us unto all good works, 2 Timothy 3 verses 15 to 17. Therefore, it is only a matter of time before the fullness of the Gentiles eventually comes in. We may look at the world and see that they are enrolled in Satan's course, Ephesians 2 verse 2. We may even see churchianity not coming into the knowledge of the truth, because they have allowed Satan and their flesh to work with the sin nature and the conscience to continue in the works of the flesh. However, the word of our God shall stand forever, Isaiah 40 verse 8. Therefore, as long as there are still people willing to, one, read and believe God's word, two, allow the Holy Ghost to teach it to them, and three, suffer persecution for that sound doctrine in their inner man, 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, slowly but surely, men will be qualified to take heavenly positions that are currently occupied by Satan's forces. Then, once all of those positions are taken, we will be gathered together unto Christ, and Satan's rebellion in heavenly places will be eliminated. Therefore, God is not just interested in getting people saved, but he is also interested in them coming into the knowledge of the truth once they are saved. The more Christians who will leave churchianity's false doctrines and embrace the sound doctrine found in Paul's epistles, the quicker this will happen, and it will only happen because we are in Christ. Therefore, stop trying to serve God out of your flesh and recognize that Christ is our life, Colossians 3 verse 4. Then, you will recognize that I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God, Galatians 2 verse 19. Religious Churchianity presents two options. 1. Drive yourself crazy under the law, try to look good to others, and go into eternity doubting your salvation, or 2. Forget about trying to obey God because you cannot do it, so, just live for the pleasures of the flesh and still go into eternity doubting your salvation. However, God presents just one option, 1. Recognize you are a sinner and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sin. God then places you into Christ so that you live by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, rather than by the law of sin and death, Romans 8 verse 2, so that you learn sound doctrine for today found in Paul's epistle, both by studying God's word rightly divided, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, and by suffering for the in Christ life, 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. You are then qualified to take a high position in heavenly places, and you have the confident expectation of this when you die. Therefore, only God gives you peace of mind. The more people who do this, the sooner eternity can begin. Remember that both your salvation and your sanctification are accomplished through the faith of the operation of God, Colossians 2 verse 12, which is the in Christ life. You do not serve God by trying to obey the law. Wherefore if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances, which all are to perish with the using? Colossians 2 verses 20 and 22, which things indeed have a shoe of wisdom, which is why churchianity embraces them, but they are really not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh, Colossians 2 verse 23. As Christians, we need to stop embracing the ideas of, 1, turning from sin, and 2, living for God in the energies of our flesh. Instead, we need to embrace the in Christ life. Only then will we give a clear gospel message that saves, and we will concentrate, not on looking good in the flesh to others, but on studying to shew ourselves approved unto God, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, and learning sound doctrine, so that we can fill those high positions in heavenly places that Christ literally died to fill with us. God never intended for you to obey the law. Churchianity thinks that, if you make an honest living, take care of your family, and stay out of trouble with the law, you are a good person. 
Then, if you believe what they teach, you are a saved person, and God will make you a better person. They expect you to try to obey the law of the conscience, before you are saved, even though you will not be that successful. Then, after you are saved, they think that God changes you somehow, so that you will now do a better job of obeying the law of your conscience. However, none of this is biblical thinking. It is all according to the course of this world, Ephesians 2 verse 2. The Bible says that there is none that doeth good, no, not one, Romans 3 verse 12. Therefore, there are no good people in this world. After you are saved, you are still not a good person, because you still have your vile flesh, Philippians 3 verse 21. Instead of making you a good person, God simply puts Christ in you so that all God sees, when he looks at you, is Christ. As such, God never intended for you to obey the law not before or after you are saved. Before you are saved, you have no faith, which means you cannot obey the law, Romans 14 verse 23. Once you are saved, you have learned the lesson of the law, which is to believe what God has told you to believe. Having learned this lesson, you are no longer under the law, but under grace. Therefore, all things are lawful unto me, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 12 and 10 23. Therefore, regardless of what side of salvation you are on, Churchianity's view of the law is incorrect. Churchianity says you can be a good, lawful person before you are saved, but you are a better, lawful person after you are saved. God says you are not good and do not obey the law before you are saved, and that the law is removed from you after you are saved. The reason for this difference is a different focus. Churchianity is focused on your flesh, and how God can make your flesh better after you are saved, because that is what puts people in the pews and money in the church leaders' pockets. God is focused on your spirit, and how he will make your spirit alive in Christ if you learn the lesson of the law. The reason churchianity focuses on the flesh is because, if they can make a fair shoe in the flesh, Galatians 6 verse 12, they have done. Something to please God. Therefore, after they are saved, they try to be good people apart from Christ, even if they give verbal credit to Christ, because they, ultimately, are the ones performing. By contrast, God gave you the law, not for you to perform it, but so that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God, Romans 3 verse 19. As such, no flesh, can, glory in his presence, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 29. Thus, churchianity starts with the foundation of the flesh, and God's word starts with the foundation of Christ. Since the only foundation that can be laid is Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11, everything that churchianity does in the flesh is of no help to anyone in the spiritual realm, even if they cloak their fleshly deeds in a form of godliness, 2 Timothy 3 verse 5. This means that, if churchianity lays a foundation of flesh upon belief in a clear gospel, all the works of churchianity will be burned at the judgment seat of Christ, 1 Corinthians 3 verses 12 to 15. If churchianity does not share a clear gospel, they will be judged by their works at the great white throne judgment and will go to hell, Revelation 20 verses 11 to 15. As such, preaching of the flesh is the most powerful device that Satan to keep people from being saved and coming unto the knowledge of the truth, going counter to God's will, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. The Hot Iron Conscience A major problem with the typical Christian mentality is that, because they are trying to obey God in their flesh by obeying the law, which is impossible to do, they have a heightened conscience after they are saved. In other words, a person believes the gospel because he finally recognizes that he is a sinner in need of a savior. Now, he is more aware of his conscience. However, instead of teaching him that he does not have to try to obey his conscience now that he is saved, churchianity tells him the opposite. It says that God will give him the power to obey his conscience. So, now he looks at his conscience more closely. However, since there is no power in his flesh to obey his conscience, he continues to sin after he is saved just as much as he did before he was saved. And, now he feels worse about it, because he notices all of the sins he is doing. Therefore, rather than believing God that he has purged his conscience from dead works to serve the living. God, Hebrews 9 verse 14, he believes man that he needs to obey the law. 
Therefore, he notices his sin more and feels even worse about himself than he did before he was saved. He can now choose to do like I did, which is to agonize over his sin to the point of regular, physical illness, where he can look to churchianity for the answer. Most will do the latter, since they already believe churchianity regarding their salvation. Churchianity's answer is to have their conscience steered with a hot iron, L. Timothy 4, 2. Biblical examples of this are, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving, 1 Timothy 4 verse 3. In other words, they make up laws that they do not mind following, which will replace the laws that they do mind following, so that they can now feel like they are living above sin and living for Christ. Jesus called the Pharisees out for doing this. He said, Ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith, Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat, and swallow a camel, Matthew 23 verses 23 to 24. Perhaps this concept will become clearer with a modern example. For Christmas 2017, personal growth, love and marriage, and healthy lifestyles were popular topics among Christian books. While God does tell us to take care of our families, 1 Timothy 5 verse 8, and love our spouses, Ephesians 5 verse 25 and Titus 2 verse 4. God does not tell us to grow personally, and He does not address passion in marriage or encourage healthy lifestyles. God actually tells us that bodily exercise profiteth little, 1 Timothy 4 verse 8. Dot. The reason that churchianity focuses on these issues is because they are of the flesh. If they focus on improving their flesh, then maybe you will not notice their lack of spiritual maturity. That is why Paul said, Refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness, 1 Timothy 4 verse 7. Now, that is profitable exercise. Therefore, they can profess to be good Christians by doing what churchianity tells them to do, even though they are not walking in the Spirit, because they are not allowing Christ to live in them. Rationalizing Bad Behavior In addition to searing their conscience with a hot iron by focusing on areas that are of little or no importance to God, churchgoers also ease their guilty consciences by rationalizing bad behavior. There are two ways in which they do this. One, they say that the Bible does not address a specific bad behavior that they want to engage in. And two, they use selective morality in which they take dogmatic stands on certain issues so that you do not see their failing in other areas. With regard to number one, if a churchgoer wants to do something that is a sin, he may redefine his behavior as not being sinful. In other words, instead of changing my behavior to match God's standard, I change God's standard to match my behavior. For example, a churchgoer may buy a lottery ticket or go to a casino. When questioned about it, he may say, the Bible never says that gambling is a sin. So, I'm okay. Or, I'm not gambling, because I'm not serious about it. I just do it for the entertainment value. Or, I'm doing it for the Lord, because, if I win, I will give 10% to the church. Then, I can quit my job and really, serve the Lord. With regard to number two, selective morality, at the time of this writing, the majority of evangelical churchgoers in the United States believe that man lying with mankind and people claiming to be the opposite gender are sinful activities. They take a moral stand on this issue, saying that they would never participate in such activities. However, the vast majority of these same people are still involved in sexual sins. They are engaged in premarital sex or adultery. Even if they are not physically doing these things, they are doing them in their heart, which is still a sin, as Jesus pointed out, whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart, Matthew 5 verse 28. This problem is rampant among evangelical churchgoers, but it is not talked about anymore, because they have rationalized away their sinful behavior by concentrating on other sins that are supposedly worse than what they are doing. In other words, their conscience is focused on sexual sin in the areas of man lying with mankind and men saying that they are women and vice versa. By doing so, they no longer feel bad about the sexual sins they are committing, both inwardly and outwardly. In other words, they point a finger at other types of sexual sin, so that their own sexual sin is not noticed by themselves or by society. 
This is called having a defiled conscience. Titus 1 verses 14 to 16. Why Churchianity Hates the Truth Since Churchianity is so bad by keeping people from being saved and coming unto the knowledge of the truth, you may wonder why Christians, when they do hear the truth, do not accept it. When I learned right division, I was overjoyed that I could not lose my salvation by sinning. When I learned about my life in Christ, I was thrilled that I could rest in who I am in Christ, rather than striving to try to obey God in the energies of my flesh. However, most Christians have the opposite reaction to the truth. Most Christians will call you a heretic and have nothing to do with you when you share with them who they are in Christ. Why? For the same reason that unbelievers usually reject the gospel, and that reason is pride. To believe the gospel, an unbeliever has to admit that he cannot save himself, and most people are too prideful to do this. Therefore, he makes up some excuse and continues on his path to hell. Assuming they heard and believed today's gospel, Christians have already taken the step that unbelievers will not take. They have recognized their sin and have trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to save them. There is the gospel again. Thus, their flesh has already suffered a great blow to their pride. Since the flesh lusteth against the spirit, Galatians 5 verse 17, the flesh reacts by trying to save face within their new belief system. 2 Timothy 4 verse 3 calls this having itching ears. In other words, they want their flesh scratched. Since churchianity wants money, it is more than happy to oblige. So, Christians learn the false doctrine of churchianity, pleasing their flesh, and deceiving themselves into thinking they are walking in the Spirit. Jeremiah 17 verse 9. Thus, they are following a flesh system, just like they did before they were saved, and their flesh is not suffering persecution for the cross of Christ. Galatians 6 verse 12. Thus, they have achieved a delicate balance in which their flesh is satisfied, their conscience is appeased, and everyone, including themselves, thinks that they are serving God. For the flesh, this is the ideal situation. But, then you come along and try to mess up their delicate situation with the truth. You tell them that ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God, Colossians 3 verse 3. You tell them that Christ is our life, Colossians 3 verse 4. You tell them that they are dead to the law, that they might live unto Christ, and that the only way to live the Christian life is for Christ to live in them by the faith of the Son of God, Galatians 2 verse 20. Now, all of this is true, and, if they are Christians, they can allow the Holy Ghost to teach these truths to them, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 13. However, they also still have their vile flesh, Philippians 3 verse 21, and so they can also choose to quench the Spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19. They can still walk in the lusts of the flesh as if they are not saved, Galatians 5 verses 16 to 18. Of course, the proper response is, God forbid, how shall we, that are dead to sin, live any longer therein? Romans 6 verse 2. However, most Christians will reject the truth and continue to follow the flesh in their churchianity. Why? As already mentioned, if they reject the truth, they can still follow the lusts of their flesh, which means they will not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ internally or from others. In referring to believing the truth of God's word over his flesh, Paul said, I die daily, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 31, meaning that his flesh died every day as he chose to believe God's word over his flesh. Since no man ever yet hated his own flesh, Ephesians 5 verse 29, very few people are willing to believe God's word over the lies of Satan that are propagated by Satan's ministers in churchianity, 2 Corinthians 11 verses 13 to 15 because believing God means that their flesh will suffer. Therefore, instead of making the Bible their final authority, they make their church their final authority. In other words, they view the church that they attend as speaking for God, rather than asking what saith the scripture? Romans 4 verse 3 and Galatians 4 verse 30. If a person changes his view and starts believing the Bible over the church, his whole fleshly system will come crashing down. First, his pride will take a blow, because what he believed is wrong and he cannot serve God in the energies of his flesh. So, now he feels stupid. 
Second, he will suffer persecution from his flesh, Galatians 5 verse 17 and 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. Third, his family will think he has backslidden because he has gone against the church. Now, his family will be hounding him to get back to church because they do not want their religious fleshly system to be damaged. Fourth, his friends in the church will also think he has backslidden. If he shows scripture to family and friends to show he is right, his family and friends will probably choose their flesh over the truth. Then, they will think he is a heretic, involved in some cult for going against established church doctrine, and they will not have anything to do with him. Such a person is treated worse than if he became a drug addict or went to prison, because at least a criminal could be reformed by the family's religion, while there is no hope for a heretic. In other words, most people in churchianity believe what they believe because the fleshly system of churchianity has taught them their beliefs. If they abandon that system of the truth of God's word, they look like backslidden sinners to the flesh. This results in them losing their family and friends and suffering in the flesh. Granted, Christ is living in them now. However, because they have had their flesh controlling them all of their Christian life, it will be very difficult for them to stop now and lose all of their social connections and standing within a community, especially since humans are social creatures. Therefore, they will reject the truth, even though only truth shall make you free. John 8 verse 32. They would rather be in bondage to sin and the devil. Hebrews 2 verses 14 to 15 and be liked by their flesh and by others than to stand in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made them free. Galatians 5 verse 1, have Christ live in them. Galatians 2 verse 20, and be shunned by most everyone, including most Christians and unbelievers. 1 I Timothy 1 15. Since we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 8, they cannot use scripture to prove you are wrong. If they do, the scripture is changed or taken out of context so that they can misapply it in order to support false doctrine. Therefore, they just label you a heretic who has joined a cult and all hope is lost for you unless you come back to the church and repent of your evil ways. God says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, Isaiah 5 verse 20. Basically, you need to understand that just because a person is a Christian churchgoer, it does not mean that that person is walking in the spirit. He can still choose to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The more he has chosen the flesh by believing churchianity, the more likely he will be to not believe the truth when you present it to him. That is why Paul told Timothy to instruct those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will, 2 Timothy 2 verses 25 to 26. My grandma, two months before her death, my grandma was praying for the Lord to forgive her. She then told her daughter that she, my grandma, was going to hell. Her daughter asked her why. My grandma said, because I don't love the Lord enough. This was the honest confession of a 106-year-old woman who was a member of the same church I grew up in, except that she believed their doctrine all of her life. She had attended over 15,000 of their services and had towed the very narrow line of her church for the last 90 years. She never smoked, never drank, always wore dresses, never cursed, tried to see the good in people, was faithful to her husband, etc. You would be incredibly hard-pressed to find any wavering whatsoever from her church's teachings for the last 90 years of her life. Yet, at the end of her life, she honestly thought she was going to hell. Why? Because, no matter how good you are, your own righteousness is as filthy rags, Isaiah 64 verse 6. There is none righteous, no, not one, they are all gone out of the way. Romans 3 verses 10 and 12. This is the lesson of this book. No matter how hard you try to obey your conscience, you will fail. Even after you are saved, you still have no power in your flesh to serve God. Romans 7 verse 18. You will fail. Instead, you should allow Christ to live in you. Galatians 2 verse 20. By using the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16. Which is the faith of Christ in God and his word. Galatians 2 verse 20. Only then will you walk in the good works that God has ordained to do through you, not you doing them for God. Ephesians 2 verse 10. The more you read and
Believe God's word, the more you are strengthened with might in the inner man, Ephesians 3 verse 16 to 19, to overcome the lusts of the flesh and walk in the spirit, Galatians 5 verse 16. Therefore, I encourage you, do not be like my grandma and try to obey God in the flesh. Also, do not be like the Christian, who uses eternal security as an excuse to sin, Romans 6 verses 1 to 2. Rather, present your body a living sacrifice unto God, so that Christ can live in you, Romans 12 verses 1 to 2. In this way, you are found in Christ, being made conformable unto his death, so that you, with Christ, attain unto the resurrection of the dead. This is a spiritual resurrection lived in this life so that you may receive the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, which is a high position in heavenly places with Christ forever, Philippians 3 verses 8 to 14. By contrast, if you walk in the lusts of the flesh, by living as either unbelievers or churchianity does, your soul will still be saved, but you will suffer loss of your reward, 1 Corinthians 3 verses 14 to 15. Do not sacrifice your eternal reward in heaven, 2 Corinthians 4 verses 17 to 18, for the temporary pleasures of sin on the earth. As we have learned, these temporary pleasures even include suffering under church religion conformity. A great example of this is Moses. Hebrews 11 verses 25 to 26 says that Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Now, you may think that this refers to when Moses led Israel out of Egypt, but it does not. Rather, it refers to the time when he was come to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Hebrews 11 verse 24. Exodus 2 verses 11 to 22 tells us the story of what happened when Moses was grown. Exodus 2 verse 11. In summary, he killed an Egyptian, who was persecuting a Jew. Israel refused to let him be their ruler, and so he left Israel, to dwell with the priest of Midian. He dwelt in Midian, not with the Jews, but with the people of God, for forty years until God called him to go back to Egypt and lead Israel into the Promised Land. What is significant about Moses' story is that he rejected both extremes. First, he rejected material wealth by forsaking the sinful lifestyle of the Egyptians. Second, he rejected following religion, which told him to be good to others. Instead, he had faith in God's promise to Israel, Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3, and acted accordingly. In other words, he forsook unbelieving Egyptians, and he forsook religious Jews. Instead, he had respect unto the recompense of God's eternal reward to him, Hebrews 11 verse 26. Similarly speaking, as members of the body of Christ, we need to reject the material riches of unbelievers and the respect of churchianity. By believing God and his word over both groups, we fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in our flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, Colossians 1 verse 24. In other words, just like Moses esteemed the reproach of Christ as greater riches by forsaking unbelieving Jews, we also should fill up in our flesh the afflictions of Christ to help believers, even though doing so means forsaking churchianity's church. Only then will we be builded together for inhabitation of God through the Spirit, Ephesians 2 verse 22.